Welcome back for the third and final mini lecture of the week. Uh, this time I'd like to talk to you about correlation functions, which are the bread and butter of uh, quantum field theory. They are the observables, along with perhaps scattering amplitudes. But there's a relation between scattering amplitudes and correlation functions. So if you have one, you have the other, essentially. So today what I'd like to tell you about is uh, constraints on these correlation functions that come from uh, the conformal symmetry. And these constraints on correlation functions, they're often called word identities. Okay, so let's get started. Let's start with a definition, definition of a correlation function. So I'll define it in terms of the path integral in, in, uh, in quantum field theory. So I have a correlation function of some set of uh, operators. In this case, I'll just assume all the operators are identical, but it's easy to generalize, just, just make them not identical. And what we do to calculate this object, this average uh, value of the operators inserted at these n different points, is we divide by the partition function, and then we multiply by that. We calculate the following integral. It's an integral over field space. From a, a rigorous mathematical point of view, this object is not all that well defined, but uh, but it's very useful from a conceptual point of view, and we can get a lot of mileage from uh, from studying its properties, even if we can't always compute it. And the z is just the same integral, but without the insertions of these operators. So it's the integral over field space of e to the i action. So the i there means I'm in a, in a Lorentzian context. If I was going to do the Euclidean path integral, which is a slightly better defined object, then that i would be, re would be replaced with a minus 1. So what I'd like to discuss today is how symmetry constrains, constrains such an object. How does symmetry constrain the correlation functions? So, so it's a symmetry. What does the symmetry mean, first of all? The symmetry means that the, the measure of the path integral and the action are invariant. That if we perform a symmetry operation on the field, uh, then the measure doesn't change and the action doesn't change. So let's introduce some notation. Let the symmetry act by sending the field phi to r times, or r acting on the field phi. So in our, in our old notation, you know, we had the conformal symmetry acting on a field and the position it was located on. In the new notation, this is what, this is what I mean by r acting on phi of x. Okay. All right, so let's see what happens to, uh, to our correlation function when we act on it uh, with, with the symmetry. So we write that on the left-hand side as r on phi of x1 all the way up to r of phi of xn. Expectation value, that's what those angle brackets are. And now on the right-hand side, I've got 1 over the partition function. That doesn't change since I have a symmetry. d phi and then r of phi of x1 to r of phi of xn, e to the i s phi. Great. So invariance, again, means that the measure d phi is the same as d of r phi. And it also means that the action as a functional of phi is the same as the action as a functional of r of phi. That's what it means to have a symmetry. Now because of that, I can then, well, I can plug those in uh, to my path integral without anything changing because I have that symmetry. I can just make the substitution now d of r of phi in the measure. I already had all of these operators inserted, r of phi of x of 1 through r of phi of x of n. And now I'm going to have e to the i s r of phi. And now for perhaps the tricky part, you know, when you do integrals, you can do an integral over x or you can do an integral over y. And you can call the integration variable x or y. It doesn't matter, right? So that's exactly what we're going to do here in this slightly more abstract setting of the path integral. We're going to relabel our integration variable. What we used to call r of phi, we'll now just call phi. Now this is a, a relabeling on the field. It's not a relabeling of space-time. So this is, a, this is an important point. When we do this relabeling, this does not shift where we put in all these operators. Okay, all these xi's. So let's do that and let's see what we get. So we, we get 1 over z, we get d of phi, through the relabeling, we get phi, but still at the transformed location, phi at the transformed location, and then e to the i s of phi. And that's the result. This is actually a rather important result. Um, we, we can, on the right hand side, right, we can write this as what? This is, uh, this is the expectation value of phi at the transformed point, r of x of 1, all the way up to phi of r of x of n. It looks like we've just done some fairly trivial manipulations with an integral, uh, but we've got out of it what turns out to be a very deep result. This is the word identity. This is the constraint on the correlation function from the symmetry. Now, I, 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 I notice I put a stray 
uh, subscript on that one there. I didn't mean to do that. So the way I've proved it, I proved it all for identical operators, but you know, I don't have to do that. It, it, just slightly increasing the complexity of the proof, I could go back now and put subscripts on my fields. So now maybe I have phi one up to phi n and then phi one down here all the way up to phi of n. And now it also holds if, if the operators are, are not the same, if these uh, quantum fields are not the same. Great, so let's go on and see see what this means. Let, let's use it and see what this means. So let, let, let's recall the transformation rule for the conformal primary operators, scalars for simplicity. So under a, a, a trivial representation of the Lorentz group, we had that phi prime of x prime, and this is what I mean by r acting on phi of x. This is omega to the delta over two phi of x. We showed this a couple of mini lectures ago. So now if I use this on my word identity, what I learn is that the product of i equals one to n omega to the delta i over two at x of i. So one of these omega factors for each of my insertions, phi of x one, phi one of x one, all the way up to phi n of x of n. This is equal to phi one at the transformed x one all the way up to phi n at the transformed x of n. Okay, now this is beginning to look slightly more useful, this result. Let's see what, uh, what it means in practice, some consequences. We could look at, for example, translation invariance, for which this omega factor is just one. There's no effect on the metric or the Minkowski tensor. We learn in this case that if we have a correlation function of, of a bunch of these operators at a shifted point, this is the same as the correlation function at the unshifted points. So there's a dependence only on the relative position. Now this shouldn't be a surprise. We have translation invariance. Every point in spacetime looks at it like uh, every other. And so if we have you know two operators inserted at a certain distance over here, they have some particular correlation function that just depends on the distance between them. And it doesn't matter whether we inserted them here or over there, as long as the dis relative distance between them is the same, the correlation function ought to be the same, just by translation invariance, right? Just by the translation symmetry of the underlying theory. Okay, so let's keep going. We can also think about Lorentz. And in this case, what we learn is that uh, we should contract the indices in a Lorentz invariant way. We have a correlation function of scalar operators, and so the overall result should be some scalar under the Lorentz group, uh, and it, it shouldn't transform. Um, so we have to contract the indices to get scalars. Okay, so now what about the two generators that are special to conformal symmetry? What about dilatations and special conformal transformations? Do we get any extra mileage uh, from these? The answer is uh, a most definite yes. So let, let's see how that works. And what we're gonna see just to advertise the strength of this result, what we're, what we're gonna find is we're gonna find that the symmetry under dilatations and special conformal transformations actually fixes two and three point correlation functions. So when you insert uh, two or three operators and calculate their correlation functions, it fixes these correlation functions up to constants. So almost completely. All right, so it's one of the nicest, most beautiful results of conformal field theory. Let me, let me try to do it justice. Two point functions. If you've had much experience with quantum field theory, you know how complicated these correlation functions can be in a general relativistic context. And it's very special that you can fix them in this uh, simple way in, in the conformal field theory context. So we'll take two distinct operators, phi one of x one, phi two of x two. And the first claim is that this has to be a function of their relative position. This is the consequence of translation invariance as we were just discussing a few minutes ago. And it's also the consequence of Lorentz that we have to look at you know, the distance between the operators is a scalar quantity rather than as a tensorial one. It doesn't matter how these two points are oriented in spacetime. It just depends on the distance between them, however they're oriented since they're scalar operators. Okay, so that's point one. Since I'm running out of room, let's go on to point two. Let's consider dilatations or scale transformations for which x goes to x prime equals lambda x. So what happens in this case? So in this case, what I learn is that phi one of x one, phi two of x two, plugging into our, um, our word identity, we learn this must be lambda to the delta one plus delta two, because now the omega factors are not just one for dilatations, they're, they're these powers of lambda. Uh, phi one at the transform point, lambda of x one. Phi two at the transform point, lambda of x two. So what does this mean? This means that f 
of x1 minus x2, this function that we got from translation and Lorentz invariance, this must be equal to lambda to the delta 1 plus delta 2 f of lambda x1 minus x2. Now a moment's reflection should convince you that the only way to satisfy such a constraint is to set the two-point function equal to the following remarkably simple form. Some constant that depends on our selection of operators, c1 and, or phi1 and phi2, over the distance between these operators raised to the delta 1 plus delta 2 power. It's one of the nicest results in, in conformal field theory. So this is fixed just by scale invariance. We haven't gotten to the conformal, special conformal transformations yet. So let's pause a minute and uh, reflect on the beauty and simplicity of this result. Okay, so moving on, let's also consider special conformal. Now, I assigned a problem uh, in chapter two, or an exercise, where you were supposed to figure out uh, this omega factor for the special conformal transformations. It winds up being uh, one minus two b dot x plus b squared x squared whole quantity squared. So in light of that, I wanted to find some uh, auxiliary quantities here. We'll call them gamma i, uh, and they're going to depend on the, the space-time points, uh, the xi, 2b dot xi uh, plus a b squared xi squared. All right, so let's copy that and put it on the next page. Now I'm going to assign yet one more exercise here. Sorry that I'm leaving so much of the work to you, but this is how you learn. If you don't do these exercises, you won't really get a feeling for the subject, I fear. So I shouldn't do it all for you. I should make you do some of it. So there's a remarkable property that I will leave you to verify. And we're going to have occasion to use this at least two more times in this lecture alone, that x1 prime minus x2 prime absolute value is the same as x1 minus x2 divided by these gamma factors, gamma 1 to the 1 half, gamma 2 to the 1 half. Okay, it's not a very hard exercise, but under special conformal transformations, this is what you should find, having fixed some vector b. Okay, so let's see what happens then. So I have my two-point function, which I claimed had the form z12 over x1 minus x2 to the delta 1 plus delta 2. So under special conformal transformations, I get a leading power of this omega, so that gives me some gamma factors, this gamma 1 to the delta 1, gamma 2 to the delta 2, over c12, x1 minus x2, delta 1 plus delta 2. So this is my word identity for special conformal. And now I'm going to use this remarkable property I just cited and left you uh, to work out. Sorry, this should be primed. These are x1 prime minus x2 prime. That's very important. But I want to remove the primes now, and to remove the primes I'm going to use this remarkable property. So I get gamma 1 gamma 2 to the delta 1 plus delta 2 over 2 power divided by gamma 1 to the delta 1 gamma 2 to the delta 2 c12 over x1 minus x2 whole thing to the delta 1 plus delta 2 power. So this is my remarkable property. Now this is a series of equalities, and so we, we, have, an, we have an issue here. Uh, this is, doesn't seem to be equal in general. It's only going to be equal uh, in two cases. We can conclude from this string of equalities that either delta 1 equals delta 2 or the constant c12 is 0 because the gamma 1s and gamma 2s are independent. This has to work for all choices of insertion, all gamma 1s and gamma 2s. And so either that, that prefactor here has to be unity, which requires delta 1 equal to delta 2, or the C12 factor has to vanish, and the whole thing is just zero. And then in either of those cases, there's no contradiction. Okay, so let's write the full result down on the next page. The claim is that for two-point functions in CFT, two-point functions of scalar primary operators, these will be in general zero if the dimensions or scaling weights of these two operators are different, or it will be C12 over X1 minus X2, the difference, the distance between them raised to the two delta one power. So in this case, delta one is equal to delta two. Now I'll make one last remark about this before going on, and that that's, that's that the C12 are often ambiguous. 
in, in uh, conformal field theory, it's possible to renormalize the fields. So remember this uh, massless scalar field I was talking about at the, at the, in, in the previous lecture, uh, where you had, I think there was a canonical factor of minus a half, and then you had an integral d dx, uh, d phi squared. This leads to one choice of c. In this case, it would be c11, one because one, it would be the same operator. But if I, would, if I was to change the normalization out front, how do I want to say this? I want to say that changing, changing the normalization, changing that factor of a half by, say, phi goes to some new value a phi, where a is some constant, this changes, changes these constants c12, or in this case c11, in, in the two-point function. So often the choice that people use in conformal field theory is they just set, they set uh, so the canonical choice, you just set all the c12 equal to 1. You rescale the fields uh, so that um, all, these, all these coefficients are 1. For composite operators, there's a more complicated story, but for these conformal primaries, um, that's, that's how it works. The fundamental fields, if you will. Okay, let's keep going. That's two-point functions. So to finish this lecture, I also want to discuss three and four-point functions and see what see what the constraints are in those cases as well. The the arguments are very similar, and so what I'll present of it will be will be somewhat more uh, concise. It will be briefer. Let's look at three-point functions. Okay, three-point functions. So here's my three-point function: three scalars, phi one of x one, phi two of x two, phi three of x three. So the claim is that if I just think about translation. Lorentz and uh, scaling, I have to have the following form for the correlation function. It's got to be a sum over terms which take a very particular uh, a form. So I've got x1, 2 to the a, x2, 3 to the b, and x1, 3 to the c. And now what do those a, b's, and c's have to be? Well, if I think about uh, uh, scaling or dilatation, when I rescale this by some factor of lambda, that overall power, overall power of lambda has to agree with the total uh, dimension of this three-point function. So I, I have a constraint here that a plus b plus c ought to be the sum of the scaling weights, delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3. So it's just a slightly general, more general form um, of the kind of thing we saw for the two-point function. And I'm using, oh, I should say one more thing. I'm using a shorthand notation. When I write xij, what I mean is I mean the distance xi minus xj. Just takes a few, uh, a, a few uh, fewer pen strokes to do that. Okay, so that's that's the first part. That's the easy part. And now we're going to apply special conformal transformations, uh, which have a, a somewhat stronger effect in this case than they did in the in the case of the two-point function. So I'm going to use again that remarkable property and also the word identity. So the word identity plus the remarkable property. It's the same procedure that we used in the case of the two-point function, and we find the following equality or following relation between these these terms that x1 2 to the a x2 3 to the b x3 1 to the c this had better be gamma 1 gamma 2 to the a over 2 gamma 2 gamma 3 to the b over 2 gamma 3 gamma 1 to the c over 2 over gamma 1 to the delta 1, gamma 2, to the delta 2, gamma 3, to the delta 3. And then that same uh, rational expression again, x1, 2 to the a, x2, 3 to the b, x3, 1 to the c. Ah, and I've buried it behind my, my picture, so let's just write that on the second line. Times 1 over x1, 2 to the a, x2, 3 to the b, x3, 1 to the c. Okay, so now we have to uh, arrange things uh, so that that prefactor is unity, just like it was in the case of the two-point function. And that's going to give me uh, three constraints on three unknowns. I've got these three unknowns, a, b, and c, uh, and in each case the power associated with gamma 1, the power associated with gamma 2, and the power associated with gamma 3, those should each vanish. So I'm going to get these three equations. So from the previous slide, remember this has to be 1, and so this gives me the three, three following linear equations. It tells me that a has to be delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3, that b has to be delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 1, and c equals delta 3 plus delta 1 minus delta 2. So of that sum over these rational terms, actually only one survives uh, this uh, conformal, special conformal symmetry constraint. So the final result for three-point functions, again, another very beautiful result from conformal field theory. If I have a three-point function of three scalar operators, it's fixed up to a constant by the symmetry. So I'm going to get a constant that depends on the three operators. I'm going to get x, 1, 2 to the delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. I'm going to get x 
two, three to the delta two plus delta three minus delta one. And then I've run out of room, so forgive me, I have to kind of squeeze this down here at the bottom. I'm gonna get x three, one to the delta three plus delta one minus delta two. One of the really nice results to come out of conformal field theory. This is again, not true in a general context. In a general context, these three point functions look much more horrible. Uh, under much uh, less control, but here they're fixed up to constants that just depend on the choice of operators. Now I wanted to make a remark. So we discussed that the Cij's, the two-point function coefficients, can be changed through normalization by just changing what you mean by the, the fields you're talking about. However, the, these three-point function coefficients, the Cijk's, these carry physical information. Or if you really want to be uh, pedantic about it, you could say the ratio of the three-point to the two-point functions uh, is, are, are, are the quantities, these ratios are the quantities that carry physical information. All right, so that's the end of my discussion of three-point functions. And then to cap off this lecture, I'd like to discuss four-point functions where things finally start to get more interesting uh, for conformal field theory under less strict control. So something special happens when you have four, four locations. You have the notion of a cross ratio. There are two independent ones, at least in, in more than two dimensions. In two dimensions, I believe these are these are uh, not independent. But in, in in more than two dimensions, in three or more dimensions, these are independent quantities. So again, I've got these four insertions: x1, x2, x3, and x4, and I can form the following ratios. And the claim is that these are invariant under the conformal group. They're invariant under translations, obviously. Uh, Lorentz, yes, because they're scalars. Uh, scaling or dilatation, yes, because I got the same number of x's in the numerator and the denominator. And finally, uh, the special conformal transformations. These are a little bit less trivial to check, but they follow from this uh, remarkable property uh, that we discussed in the context of the two-point functions and then used again for three-point functions. Okay, so you have these invariant quantities, and because you have these invariant quantities, you can now build up interesting functions of them that are also invariant. And so this is what happens with the four-point functions. Uh, because you have these cross ratios now at your disposal, you can't, unique, you can't uniquely fix the form of a four-point function. The best you can do is the following. You have phi one x one, phi two, of x2, phi 3, of x3, phi 4, of x4. This is f, some undetermined function of these cross ratios, f of uv, and then a prefactor uh, which is fixed on us by, uh, by how it should transform under, under scaling and, and um, under dilatation and special conformal transformations. I need this prefactor which is universal where I can constrain the delta j by taking a sum over j that's not equal to i of delta ij, this has to be delta i. So from special conformal transformations and, or, and, and scaling, uh, I have this constraint on, on the prefactor. But f of u and v is not constrained further from this current viewpoint. Now one of the purposes of the, of the, the series of lectures going forward is to find other ways to constrain uh, f of u and v. Uh, this notion of the conformal bootstrap and crossing symmetry, which we will get to by and by. But from this analysis that we presented uh, so far, there's no, no further constraint on f of u and v. Okay, so that, that more or less concludes the lecture. I'll just point out that uh, we were only talking about scalars uh, here. You can also discuss constraints uh, on fields that transform under Lorentz, so not scalars. So I can restore this generalized index i for our conformal primary field. And one thing I'd like to do in the online lecture is I'd like to look at uh, two special cases, a J mu, which are conserved currents, and the stress tensor, T mu nu. So I want to look at these two, two examples and I'll, I'll do this in the, in the online lecture. Okay, so I'm going to end there uh, and we'll come back next week and talk uh, about more, uh, more conceptual uh, issues in, in conformal field theory. I'll, I'll talk a little bit next week about um, the operator product expansion and radial quantization and all that good stuff. So tune in next week and we will get yet deeper into our study of conformal field theory.